Trade Center San Diego is effectively the international team within the San Diego Regional EDC, uh, which is a nonprofit economic development organization here in San Diego. Uh, World Trade Center really focuses on three things, cultivating a pipeline of export ready firms here in San Diego, maximizing foreign investment opportunities, uh, and generally enhancing the global brand of San Diego as a choice destination and business hub for high growth industries. Um, Relating to our export work, we really execute that in two ways, through two programs. The first is through this relationship with the SVDC network. Um, what this allows us to do is host export workshops like this, provide companies at no cost with good actionable market intelligence on target markets around the world, uh, and also to provide personalized counseling with technical advisors who we've partnered with. Um, the second is our flagship export assistance program, MetroConnect, which you can think of as sort of a premium export program for companies that are ready and looking to scale their international growth. Um, what that entails uh, is a $5,000 export grant for 15 competitively selected companies with the opportunity to win an additional $25,000 at the very end of the program for the best performing company. Throughout that program, we also offer export workshops uh, partnerships with international airlines that fly out of San Diego International Airport, a large domestic and international network in terms of mentors and service providers, and of course, uh, relating to today's topic, access to premium translation services that will allow you to build a relationship with customers overseas and grow your revenue. Next slide, please. So in today's webinar, as I, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about translation uh, which is such a critical part of your export journey um, from building awareness with the customer base overseas to cultivating relationships, executing those sales, and then after that, customer support as well. And so we're very fortunate to have with us today Ken Bean. He's a vice president with language machine translation uh, leader, Cistrin, which has worked with Coca-Cola, with the Olympics around the world, and has really just been a leader for more than 50 years in the space. Uh, and today he's gonna talk with all of you about some of the challenges that you'll encounter and some of the different ways that you can resolve language translation issues. So without further ado, um, I'll pass things over to Ken. Thanks again for being with us today, uh, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Lucas, and good morning, everybody. And uh, hopefully I am now sharing my slides. So today we're going to chat about the uh, the challenges, as Lucas said, around going global. Uh, I've been in the language business for uh, 24 years at this stage and have seen hundreds of companies uh, go global and the challenges they have, they have uh, faced. And what I want to do today was start with sort of some high level uh, observations uh, from that perspective. And the first one is uh, a very important one, which is that the cost of the technology has massively decreased over those 25 years, as many other technologies have. But uh, even, you know, for instance, with our own product in Cistran, uh, the cheapest product, so to speak, um, 18 months ago was probably around $6,000. Today, it's, you know, $49.99. Uh, so huge decreases in, in the cost of technology across the board and a lot of the technologies we'll, we'll be talking about today. And that obviously has a knock-on effect in the ability for companies uh, to go global. Um, 20 years ago, it was probably the privilege of large corporations uh, to do it. Today, it's uh, literally uh, anybody uh, can start uh, on the journey of going global. Uh, the second observation I've seen is that companies tend to underestimate the effort that's involved. Uh, there's quite a bit, um, and we'll go through that journey, or certainly part of that journey uh, today. But um, I've seen over the years the language element of it uh, has been sort of pushed to the, the, the end of the queue, so to speak, and uh, as a result, uh, causing uh, some stumbling blocks uh, along the way. Uh, another observation is the opposite to that, that companies tend to uh, underestimate the returns from going global. Um, you know, in, in the US here, there, there's a, a large market of, uh, depending on, on where you, what product you sell, but with over 300 million people, there's, there's a large market to, uh, to, to begin with. 
and it always uh, fascinates me uh, and recently i was speaking to the chairman of uh, wd40 and uh, he reminded me that 65 percent of their uh, revenue now comes from overseas which i would have always considered wd40 to be a very much a, a it's a san diego company and a, a local to america but even a company like that is now generating more, far more revenue externally uh, from from global markets than it is uh, within the US. Uh, the fourth point I'd, I'd make is that there is no magic uh, playbook or formula in general. Um, and uh, an example of that is actually Sister and ourselves. Uh, last year, um, we probably didn't choose the best year of all to uh, expand again, but we um, opened an office in uh, Japan. And in that particular case, we decided to put people on the ground and uh, grow it uh, from a base there. Whereas we moved into several other uh, countries uh, in Latin America uh, equally. And but we what we did in that particular case uh, was go through partnerships. So there's there's no one set formula for how you do this there's no one set uh, playbook so being flexible and understanding which way uh, which market you're going to go into and how you approach that uh, can be quite different and finally in in overall and uh, i've been surprised uh, with this uh, over the years that making a plan is probably the first place to start and i know it, it probably sounds like common sense but I've been surprised over the years at how many people actually haven't got a, a plan that at the end of the day, they can both inspect uh, what uh, they are expecting. And at the end, that, that to me is the most important part, um, because if you set the targets, you set the budgets, you have the plan in, in place, you've chosen the target market, you've done your research, you then set about um, going into that market. Being able to inspect what you expect is the most important uh, part of that, and, and having a plan, plan is the best way uh, to achieve that. So having said all that, uh, let's start off with uh, the question, why bother with uh, language uh, it, it, overall? And the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer back in the 70s uh, in Germany, Willy Brandt, uh, became famous for this particular saying, if I'm selling to you, I speak your language. And if I'm buying, dann müssen sie Deutsche sprechen. And uh, I'm sure we don't need any translation for that. It was a very clear message that he sent out and was encouraging people to, uh, especially within Europe, to appreciate that language was a very important thing. And what you'll find, um, as many of you maybe have already, is when you start going out um, and uh, conversing with people, there is an expectation that uh, you will uh, use their language, certainly to do uh, to do trade and uh, to transfer um, information, content, so to speak. And if we look at it by the numbers, um, we have uh, typically uh, to, by the end of uh, next year, we see that 16 languages uh, will be needed to reach 90% of uh, the world's wallet so um you know it that's grown it was uh, three or four years ago it was 10 it, it's ever increasing but still it's a small number relative in relative terms uh, that you need uh, to reach uh, a, a very very big audience and you know simply put 60 percent of consumers expect service in their native language uh when they reach out to brands so there's an expectation already there and i'll be going through further statistics as i go through um the presentation today and, and merely to highlight uh, what's actually happening um in in the real world today and why language is important uh, similarly uh, websites uh, for the top 150 brands have an average of 32 languages uh, we have some customers um and they have uh, one in particular is a large electronics uh, customer and they have uh, 110 languages on their website uh, and thousands upon thousands of catalogs so the management of that in itself is, is quite tricky but they want to very much not just reach markets but also reach what they perceive to be as niche markets so they don't look at latin america they look at mexico chile uh argentina so on and so forth so many different flavors of the same language uh, being spanish and um interestingly enough when we look at the the top four languages that are spoken uh, it's english chinese spanish and arabic but if we look at the top four 
used on websites. It's English, Russian, German, and Japanese. So they're, they're, they are different, and they're different for different reasons, and it tends to be around market penetration, uh, markets chosen by companies to go global into. And uh, again, these are just observation points, but very important when we start thinking about you know why why is language important um, and what you know what challenges uh, are we going to face so if we if i move forward to the first of these challenges and it's your global website so today i'm sure you all have a website uh, it, it's rare that that anybody would be in business today uh, without having uh, a website but turning that into a global website um, or enhancing that website uh, is uh, fundamental in attracting a uh, the new audience that you want to. So starting from left to right here, the first sort of area that we, we look at is, is this the uh, website to be static or is it dynamic? And the importance of this is uh, based on the amount of change that takes place uh, dur uh, over the duration of your website. So if you have, if you, if your product specs change frequently, if you have um, many, many um, products that you change reference points, prices, it can become quite a nightmare to manage uh, if it's a static website. And what that means is you, you create a language version. So for instance, if you have the English website, then you have the Spanish, the German and the French website, you would have four effectively separate websites tied together with one uh, landing or pillar page. Uh, so that's a static website. The alternative way of doing that is, is what's known as a dynamic website. And what this allows you to do is purely edit the content in on the English site and then have that automatically updated to the various other uh, sites that you have. Now, in the case I cited earlier with the large electronics company, it would be impossible for them to manage a static site. Uh, they need to be able to just... Um, create the content once and then translate and disperse that amongst the many, many different websites uh, that they have. Um, the second one and um, slightly less important are images. Um, certainly back uh, when I started in the language business 25 years ago, all the talk was make sure that you have the, white, uh, the right web um, images on, on your brochures, on your website and so on and so forth. And, you know, instances were given of you know hand signals for instance uh, are um seen as rude in some parts of the world um the famous one was the um the yellow cab which is synonymous with um uh, new york but is not synonymous with um uh, porto in lisbon for instance where the cabs are white and are all mercedes so creating the right images to fit in with the um with the, the destination uh, that you're going to be selling into is, is very important. Also, layout is very uh, important to take on board. And the reason for this is that when you go from English to another language, um, you typically see an expansion in the characters. So, for instance, German goes adds roughly about 15% to the word size in general. So, as a result, if we were looking at this page here, you would end up having a slightly different format uh, if it was displayed in German because the words themselves are longer. Now, in this particular case, there's lots of space on the page and you'd probably see these icons would be pushed out a bit because the um, the text below them uh, would, would have expanded. Uh, but it, especially if you have heavy text portions of your website, you, you've got to be cognizant of the fact that when you translate it, it's going to expand and will look different from that perspective. Um, also, you know, the, there is, um, you know, the, the important part of making sure that when you present in a, um, in a different country, you may um, want to uh, present it totally different. Uh, so for instance, uh, again, in Sistran's case, our Japanese uh, website is very, very different to our French website, which is very different to our US website. And the reason for that is that different things are import more important in different uh, countries and emphasizing them, whether it's on your homepage or how you, you know, special offers is a great example. So in German, um, 
they, they tend not to want to know about if buy two get get one free or 25 percent off if you buy within the next two hours um they, and they tend to be put off by that they want more structured if you're going to give a discount um you know it needs to be in a more structured um manner uh, than anything else so being cognizant of these things are very uh, very important internationalization itself is uh the ability to, to make sure that what whatever your your whatever language you're going into, uh, that the the site still runs and runs efficiently in that that um, in that that language. Asian languages are double byte enabled, uh, so therefore you have that challenge or can have that challenge, especially if you've got pop up calculators and stuff like this, which are becoming um, quite effective these days. So calculate your ROI if you're going to buy my product. Um, and, or the e-commerce site, which we'll get onto in, in, in a little while. Um, so the internationalization aspect of that, making sure that it runs when it goes into the um, in, into the foreign language is important. SEO, again, something that people forget about um, and that it's not the same SEO. Your English SEO won't work for your Japanese site and so on and so forth. Um, and again, there's a really good webinar on uh, the Sistram page about that uh, if, if you want to get more details on that. Uh, mobile friendly is becoming more important as well as uh, we'll see some of the data later on um, more and more people are now uh, viewing uh, their and maybe some of you are watching this uh, this presentation on on your mobile so more and more people are moving to that as a, a platform so making sure that it works and it, it looks well on on a mobile phone is probably as important if not more important than um, than it working on on a desktop and then finally, uh, GDPR, which some some or maybe all of you are are, are familiar with at this stage. Uh, this is the Data Pr Privacy Act that's uh, in Europe, and being cognizant of that when you're asking for um, information, you know, please submit a, your form here and so on and so forth. Uh, if you're you, cookies, which you know most websites do, making sure you have the notice around the fact that you are storing co cookies. And just being careful that you don't get caught out with the data that you've asked, uh, and especially within the um, the e-commerce platform, that you are uh, in compliance with GDPR. Uh, just as a side note to that, um, Asia is also working on a, a similar function to, uh, to similar similar legislation, should I say, uh, to GDPR, and also with the breakup of uh, or Brexit, as it, as it's been famously known, uh, the UK is also working on uh, legislation which will be separate again. So, you you may find yourselves uh, having to you know comply with three different uh, standards, a uh, four if you include the CCPA here in the, in uh, in California. Uh, just a very quick note on colours. Um, and again, uh, th this chart here, you know, shows the preference of colors uh, by different countries. So again, this is another reason to um, very much localize your uh, your color palettes to appeal to the audience. And an example here um, is red. So in Germany, it's unlucky and it's seen as negative. In Denmark, Romania and Argentina, it's seen as lucky. In China, it's also lucky and apparently brides. Uh, it's a bride's color and it means love. Uh, in France and the UK, it's masculinity, and here in the US, it's uh, amore, it's love. So different colors mean different things to people, and it's important uh, in the same way as uh, image imagery uh, that you get those right. So that you you know ultimately, what you want to be sure is that people are staying on on the page. So let's say you've got your website now sorted. So the next thing that happens is you uh, receive an email like this one that's on, on the screen now. And uh, as tends to happen, we all gather around the screen and go, wow, what, what is this? Oh, I see our product here uh, is listed. And so it obviously, it's something to do with our products, but this is the, the first challenge that most companies have when it comes to uh, you know translation. So what does this mean? Uh, and you know, is it an order? Is it somebody suing us? Is, is it somebody stealing our patent? What does it actually mean? And um, typically, you you have a number of choices. You go out to either one of the um, the free websites that are available today, or you have in-house software, and you uh, you know well. You, you can either automatically or get you know that it's Korean. 
uh, and it's translated, you're wanted to translate into English and you find out uh, to the supplier, I'd like to know how to purchase six uh, said top licenses. Thank you, Sam Kim. So this is great news. Um, we've put our website out now and suddenly people are interested in it. Uh, so I will, I did a little recording here, uh, if you just bear with me. And I'll just press play on this to show you this. This is what happens in the Sistran. Uh, so I receive mails in every day. So the text is here for the reply. So I'm saying thank you for inquiry, Sam, so on and so forth. So what I do is simply highlight it. And the system on the right hand side goes away. It translates it into Korean. I press replace the selection. It replaces it, as you can see, on the left hand side. And I press send and away it goes. So um, I become, uh, as I do every day, a, uh, a language ninja, as, as we like to call, <laughs> call it. And uh, what that simply means is that I have, because I have, uh, I use our tools, I have access to 140 languages. And um, most of the time, people uh, don't, uh, actually, some of the time people comment, oh, your French is very good, or your Korean is very good, or whatever. Um, and some some of the time I, I do put a, um, a disclaimer that that it has been translated via um, uh, machine translation. But because of the neural engines today um, and AI, the quality of the translation is extremely good. So from that perspective, um, it, it is very close to humans, specifically when it's in in email format. Uh, so we, we've sent off our, our um, email now and we're waiting the response and that's when the busy work uh, really begins so um you know the things we now need to think of from an omni channel perspective is okay we've now got to provide a quote because um, the guy's going to come back and tell us what exactly he's looking for and so on and so forth so that will need to be translated uh we're going to have to start putting our selling materials um you know whatever that content happens to be we have to make that available now in the uh, the language and then, of course, there's the contract, and that needs to be translated, and then it needs to be modified, usually, and then translated again, and then that goes through a loop. So that tends to be, again, depending on, on your product, tends to be quite a, a lengthy process, or can be. Uh, and then the next part is the order comes through, and we're all happy and uh, delighted. We've made our first sale in this particular case in Korea, and now we've got to translate the manual, uh, which is the next uh, challenge that we have. And then we move on. We, we want to, you know, um, send out an invoice, get paid for it, which is also important. So we have to translate that. And then there's all the, the correspondence that's been going on uh, via mail. Uh, and usually uh, the, the, the statistics I've seen on it is somewhere between 20 and 30 uh, mail exchanges take place prior to an order uh, being placed. Some of you may find that's even even greater, but that's typically what we've seen when we when we have uh, researched it. So all of a sudden from, you know, just putting the website up, we've suddenly got a huge amount of content that we need to uh, to translate and uh, to, to, to just fulfill that order. And this is why going back to the, the my one of my first points, having a plan around how you're going to address these issues. Uh, prior to to um, kicking things off is is always important. Uh, and unfortunately, the next thing, or fortunately, um, you can't have problems without having customers. Uh, so the next thing you need to do is start responding to uh, customers. And um, what we, what again we hear is that seventy four percent of customers are more likely to buy if the support is in their language. So again, um, as part of the um, the proposal phase before an order is made, you know the question comes up. Um, uh, you know how are you going to support us? Where is your support? Uh, you know what's uh, how how do I get in in contact with people? Because yeah, especially if it's it's a fairly significant purchase, people want to know exactly how this all works. Um, but and typically, you know, the first thing you look at, we, we have uh, an existing um, call center or maybe, you know, five or six people who support our products here. How can we use those support agents better? And uh, is there a place for machine translation in this? And the good thing is, uh, yes, is the answer to that. And as an example, so this is a, a chat uh, that's taken place here. 
in Spanish and here's the response. This is uh, an integration into Salesforce. Uh, it could also be integrated into into Zendesk and several other products. So what you're seeing here on the uh, left hand side of the screen is the the translated. This is what the um, the um, agent sees and they're typing away in English. And on the on the far side, the customer uh, gets a, gets the response in Spanish and then continues to um, ask the questions or any further questions that they have in um, in Spanish. So again, a very simple thing to do, and it allows you to maximize the resources you already have. I, I believe um, the cost for a, a, a multilingual agent is somewhere around fifty, sixty thousand uh, dollars a year. So relatively at a, ver a fraction of that cost, uh, as I say, you, you can turn your, your um, call agents into um, language ninjas, which is great. Uh, so now let's have a, a quick look at um, the impact on e-commerce. And uh, again, what I want to just focus on here is, is some of the data points um, we, we get research done for us by a company called Nimsy. And these are some of the, the, the feedback uh, that they have given us. So nine out of 10 internet users, whenever given a choice, prefer to visit a website in their own language. And this is, um, you know, I, I'm surprised it's so high that in that regard, and I suppose it, it's all about the wording of it, that they prefer to have it. But ultimately, it means uh, when you're competing out there uh, to win, firstly, the eyeballs and then the orders, uh, having it in the, uh, the both, both the e-commerce site, which can be part of your website or separate. So you, you may have something like Shopify separately to your main website, uh, but having that in the uh, in the local language is, is extremely important. Um, in from a European perspective, fifty seven percent of Europeans on average feel uneasy about security um, about security of their data, according to Semantics data. So this is quite interesting, uh, and it speaks to the whole uh, GDPR um, aspect of things, and uh, there. For, as a European and an Irishman, I know um, when it comes to data protection, it's it's something that I'm quite passionate about, and you know who's who's keeping my information, where it's being kept, and all that kind of stuff. And it tends to be, you know, especially if if Europe is one of your main um, markets um, that you want to go after, it's very important that you take um, heed of this and uh, be aware that it, it is in the uh, it, it is on the agenda uh, very much in. Um, in Europe. And looking at an e-commerce site, here's just a few pointers um, that you need to be cognizant of. Firstly, uh, currency and applicable pricing. So um, again, from an internationalization perspective, uh, you may know this already, but for instance, in Germany, instead of using commas, which we do to donate thousands and millions, they use uh, dots or full stops. So it, it can be very off-putting. Uh, and uh, again, you, you, you can have dropout very quickly if the currency itself isn't displayed correctly. And also, you know, if, if people are in Europe, they want to buy in euros, uh, they may want the choice of buying in dollars or other currencies or maybe even Bitcoin these days, uh, but they do need that choice. Uh, similarly, payment methods is important. Um, we, we actually had a, um, uh, this year, uh, we found out, uh, for instance, we use Stripe uh, for our uh, payments and um, found out that in Korea, th there, there isn't a Korean offering for Stripe. So we had to have a specific payment um, option for Korea, which was totally different. So again, at the planning phase, these are good times to, to figure out, especially if, you, if your products, you, you want people to, to buy online from you, uh, just make sure that the payment methods are available. And then the, the simple things like the, the shipping, the delivery, and the return information and policies are all available in the native language. Um, and you know, it goes without saying that all, all the content displayed on, on the site is in the native language. And strangely enough, and maybe you've encountered this as well, but uh, with some sites, uh, even large corporations and in some languages, when you start going into to the site itself and start diving down, in it, you'll actually see that the first two or three pages are in uh, in the native language, and then they revert back back to English, and this creates a very bad impression 
especially as the next one around product information. And I spoke earlier about special sales and online offers, making sure that they're um, focused um, specifically for the uh, market you're going into and understand the dynamics of, of um, what's at play when you offer discounts to in, in different countries. Um, and then obviously customer support, which we've spoken to uh, already. Uh, another interesting uh, data point that we got from NIMSI was that a very accurate one, I would think, 56.2% of, co uh, consumers, um, to, to 56 of consumers, the ability to obtain information in their own language is more important than price. Now, this is really powerful if you think about it, uh, that the they're not necessarily thinking in terms of what's the cheapest product I can buy to fulfill the needs that I have. They're actually thinking of what's the what's firstly, what can I understand uh, about this product? And it, it is more important uh, than price. So uh, quite a powerful message being sent out there. And uh, finally, 42 percent of people polled said uh, they never buy products where the information is only provided in another language than their own and again this is something that uh, you know corresponding to the nine out of ten who would prefer to have it in their language 42 percent of people are now saying i'm not even going to think about it if it's not available in my language and this number is so slowly creeping up um and again this number reflects back to uh, mid last year and with the pandemic many many things have, have changed you know the digital revolution has really kicked in and I wouldn't be surprised when the, the next survey is done if if that 42 percent is now, you know, up at 70 based on on the amount of time that people are spending online these days and, and, and shopping in that, that uh, forum. And uh, finally, always research on what the most utilized form of payment is in the specific country. Uh, that you are going to. So uh, I, I gave this, sorry, I, I did give this example out a little earlier, uh, but it, it's very, very important that from a, a payment perspective that uh, obviously getting paid is important, but uh, even more important that it's an acceptable form. The the amount of dropouts uh, from a, a cart perspective uh, because people could not, um, didn't want to, to um, utilize the payment that was being offered uh, is quite staggering. Um, Next, I just want to talk through um, video coming of age. And it, this is important. And you, you've probably seen this uh, yourselves uh, from a, uh, a local perspective um, or even in, in, in your local market that you're selling in today. Today, I won't go through all of these points, but effectively, video has become a, a real driver in relation to um, people buying. And uh, that whole education process, um, you know, we're all aware that 60 to 70 percent of the buying decision is already made before the prospect ever contacts you. So um, if they can watch a video for two minutes uh, and digest that, uh, they will do that uh, rather than read about something. Uh, so these are just some some important points, you know. Uh, for instance, mobile video consumption has uh, risen 100% uh, every year. So it, it, it's continually rising and even more, as I say, through uh, the, the pandemic. And the relevance when it comes to, to language is in a thing called uh, caption, uh, captioning or subtitling. And I just want to briefly go through this uh, with you guys. And firstly is the... Um, you can have subtitles that generate automatically so you can put your uh your um your video up on youtube and uh, with a little work you can get it to automatically uh, do the translation for you now it's not great but it you know compared to nothing it's not bad and i've seen people use it quite effectively where certainly out of nowhere they have 10 you know 10 language versions of 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 a video um, you can also do, you, you have a number of different options when it comes to um, subtitles and you can, there, there are many different products out there, but you can firstly hard code them or uh, you can actually download them and have them as a separate, what's known as an SRT file so that in certain cases you can turn them on and turn them off depending on, on what you want to do. So if, for instance, you have just one video and you don't want to replicate it uh, and you just want to uh, have, uh, you know, you, you want to direct at a certain audience for a certain time and, and do A-B testing, you can turn on, uh, you know, a French um, 
subtitles and then turn on German and so on and so forth. So it's a good way when uh, during that testing phase as opposed to going straight to the, the hard-coded subtitles. Uh, and also, again, playing back to the, the whole area of color, size, uh, position, they, they all uh, contribute, and you probably know this from um, you know, doing video yourselves in, in, in your business every day and promoting your business that way. But uh, equally, the the um, the references I made earlier in regard to web uh, are true when it, when it comes to video. And then um, from a, a transcribe and translate, transcribe means that you take the, um, the, the words that were said, for instance, the words I'm, I'm speaking now, and you transcribe them uh, in in that language. So uh, the the uh, those words would uh, be first translated in my case into english and then at that particular stage uh, you can use dictionary functionality um i use certain words um people always laugh at me when i talk about putting my uh jumper on uh which uh, is my sweater you guys would call it a sweater and uh, had a funny one the other day where i told uh, one of my colleagues about a hamper i'd received a lovely hamper from my uh, son and uh, he he was kind of looking at me astonishingly, and uh, then I realized my hamper in, contained a nice bottle of champagne and fruit and chocolates. His hamper had dirty laundry in it. So, um, you know, the same same words can mean very very different things, and what, that's why dictionaries become important, even when you're transcribing in in English. And then um, again, when you do the the translation, so again, in a lot of cases, it's just a simple click of a button and the translation takes place. Uh, but again, text does expand, as I said earlier, between 10 and 15%. So ultimately, uh, you know, the question is asked, will I still, you know, with all this technology that's av available, will I still need human translation? And the answer is yes. Um, and one of the ways around that, and one of the ways that companies, I've seen companies um, do it in the past is to involve their distributors uh, where possible. So. Um, you, you use technology to, to get you to, uh, that first uh, part, and then you use your, uh, your in-country distributors, if that's the, the way you're, you're, you're going to go, uh, to, um, to, to verify and review the translation. Uh, legal documents um, should always be trans uh, reviewed by a native a speaker. Um, obviously, a contract is something that's upholding at the end of the day, and while the machine will be as good as it possibly can every day of the week. Um, it's always better to get a, a legal eagle to uh, to overlook it and, and just be, be sure that it, it is what it, what it says and what you want it to say. And uh, from a marketing point of view, you've got to be careful around slogans. There's the famous one uh, in China where Pepsi uh, had the slogan, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave, which um, I don't know. I don't drink Pepsi, but I don't believe it does that. Uh, and there's been there's many, many. If you go onto the web, you'll see some of them very funny, some of them not so funny. Um, but uh, just be careful around marketing slogans. And in general, when you're doing content, if you start thinking in terms of this is going to go into many, many languages, um, Hang Ten is an example that I came across years ago uh, from Disney. And um, living in Ireland at the state uh, at that stage, I had no clue what Hang Ten is. Now, obviously, living in California, I understand it very well. And uh, but stuff like that can be, uh, you know, is just not going to work when you when you go on the uh, the world stage. Uh, and ultimately, at the end of the day, if you do use human translations today, if you use technology, you, you're typically seeing we you know our customers see savings in the seventy percentile. Um, so because you're moving to a review process only, and that's uh, partly due to the fact that uh, today's engines are all um, uh, are neural engines and provide a much better uh, quality output. So at this stage, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully I've covered uh, plenty of areas uh, that will spike your interest. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions now if we have them in the chat. And I'll hand back to you, Lucas. Thank you, Ken. Uh, appreciate the presentation and really informative. As Ken mentioned, I know we have some people on the call. Uh, if you would like to post your questions in the chat box, uh, we'll give you a minute or two here. And also, Ken, did you want to talk a little bit about the, the event that you have coming up? Um, we will be sending the link out to 
all of the attendees of this webinar as well. Oh yes, thank thanks for for reminding me of that, Lucas. So I I've gone into um, the the various areas at a, at a very high level. Um, we're actually holding a, go, a going global event for SMBs uh, on the twenty eighth of April, and um, covering many of the topics that that I've spoken of today. It's a it's a three hour event, and there will be um, half a dozen vendors actually showing you the technology in action. So not just just people like myself talking for forty five uh, minutes or so, but um, but you you could actually be able to see the the products in action, and we'll also you'll have an opportunity afterwards to to virtually meet with them at the um, at conference tables that we'll have. Uh, so thanks thanks for sharing that that link with people.